So let's get started. Um, our panelists today are from Signature Bank. We have Jeff Lamb, who's the Managing Director of Technology Banking, JC Simbana, who's the SVP of Life Sciences and Digital Health, and Michael Fulton, who's the Managing Director of Venture Capital Services. I'll pass it over to Jeff um, so you can introduce yourself and your team. Great, thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, so a little bit about uh, Signature and then uh, briefly on my role, I'd like to turn it over to uh, JC. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for, for having us and for participating today. Uh, Signature is a 20-year-old uh, bank. We are headquartered, as the name implies, in Bank New York in New York City. Um, we are about a 20-year-old 20, 20 enterprise, um, consistently one of the top-rated banks in the United States, whether for financial health or for uh, the manner in which we're, we're run. Um, and uh, we are uh, about a $50 billion asset bank um, with uh, operations that are national in scope, just about 100 lines of business, uh, with the venture banking division being one of the newer divisions to Signature Bank. Um, we've been prosecuting this particular business model for about uh, 18 or 19 months um, nationally from coast to coast. Um, the, uh, the bank, uh, at least as it relates to the, the venture banking operations, is split into you know, sort of two areas, one of which uh, Michael Fulton will speak to in more detail in a moment, but that is as it relates to providing debt capital to VC, growth equity, and private equity funds at a national scale. Um, and then as it relates to the portfolio company lending um, for institutional venture back companies, uh, JC will hit on the life sciences and healthcare side of things, and I'll hit briefly on the tech uh, side of things, which dovetails into my role at Signature. Uh, I run the Midwest uh, for the group. Um, that's a 13 state geography that stretches from uh, Eastern Ohio to the Dakotas, and then sort of that Mason Dixon line north um, up just up into just about the border with, uh, with Canada. Um, it is uh, one of the emerging markets in the United States. We are seeing tremendous uh, deal flow uh, activity, uh, tremendous uh, startup uh, growth and venture capital fl uh, flows uh, through our geography, not only with funds indigenous to this corridor, uh, but also with coastal funds um, desirous of, of investing here. And so our role is really threefold um, in terms of leveraging our national platform. One is to provide senior debt capital into uh, situations of uh, companies that have been institutionally venture financed. Typically that series A uh, range is, is when we get involved. The second is uh, again, leveraging our, our platform. Um, if we can provide uh, networking connections, et cetera, either to uh, prospective uh, portfolio companies or to the funds. So whether that's deal flow, et cetera. And then finally on the insight side, uh, we see a lot of emerging trends um, not only regionally, regionally, but at a national scale. And so to the extent that that can be uh, beneficial to either you uh, that are participating in this forum or to our venture partners, uh, we'll put those forth uh, to, those, to those groups. And so that's a little bit about us. I'd like to turn it over to JC and, and sort of take the football from here. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is JC Simbana. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, and cover healthcare uh, broadly, so that includes your traditional kind of life science uh, sectors of biotech, medtech, diagnostics, tools, uh, and then increasingly more and more uh, on the digital health side of things. So I joined the bank uh, about two and a half months ago, um, but I've been working in this sector uh, both regionally uh, and also uh, from a sector standpoint since 2002. Uh, and, and as Jeff said, you know, we work with entrepreneurs and helping them solve some of their uh, sort of capital problems or capital issues in, in helping provide some, uh, some debt capital to uh, extend runway and in some cases uh, help finance uh, growth for companies. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thanks, JC. Michael Fulton, I uh, joined the bank with Jeff about 18 months ago and um, head the venture capital services team. So we work with investors and their funds, their management companies and their general partnerships in commercial banking needs. So whether it be uh, lines of credit at the fund level or deposit accounts for uh, SPVs, you know, we kind of cover the range with the goal of really giving excellent service to these investors so that we are a first thought, first referral source to their best portfolio companies. 
and then we can introduce Jeff and JC. Um, so we're looking for early stage all the way up to growth stage. Um, Signature has a separate team that does private equity and, and real estate funds as well, um, but we're hyper-focused on the venture um, sector. And so um, typical fund ranges are 5 million uh, to up to say you know, 500 million. So fairly wide range, but kind of really narrow it down to 25 to, um, to about 150 is really a, a sweet spot where we think we can add a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit plus grow with, with firms. So that's a little bit about us. Back to you. Great. Jane. Great. Thank you all. Um, so let's jump in. Um, so venture debt can be a complex and confusing tool to navigate. Can uh, you outline how venture debt can be utilized by tech and life science startups and venture funds? Uh, Jeff, I'll let you kick it off. Certainly, yeah. So as it relates from our orientation, which is the technology uh, side of things, hardware, software, material sciences, and then maybe a little more germane to the Midwest being um, ag tech, you'll, you'll probably hear me say over the course of, of uh, this forum something uh, by the words of institutional venture finance, um, which is the anchor point of our involvement um, into a prospective uh, portfolio company. And it makes sense uh, mostly when a company is um, on the doorstep or having just completed um, an institutional round of equity. Um, so the way we define that typically is around that $4 million of fresh paid in capital kind of demarcation line um, where a VC has taken roughly speaking about a 10% stake in a uh, enterprise and has some uh, form of a board seat uh, as it relates to you know, uh, typical governance uh, structure. Um, for you as an operator, um, you, you know, why would you pursue senior venture debt um, you know, and exploring that as part of your capital structure? Well, there's, there's about four reasons why. Um, and uh, probably the biggest of which is it can meaningfully extend your uh, cash runway uh, once you've raised by six months or more, uh, depending on what the burn profile of your, of your particular business is. Um, once we are involved and once we're your incumbent bank, um, we will be arguably bridging you then to the next round when you raise your series B round. Um, and then you raise that capital. And then at that point in time, we typically upsize our facility and sort of curate it with a level of specificity where it really matches your business model because let's face it, a lot of business models evolve over the course of, of a handful of years. Um, the third is we're here to amplify returns um, for you as the operator of the business, as the equity holder of the business, as well as for, for the VCs. Um, we, can, we can meaningfully amplify the economics um, back to the respective uh, limited partners as well as the different shareholders of the business. And then uh, one of the biggest reasons we oftentimes hear is that uh, we're just one of the best forms of non-dilutive capital in the marketplace. Um, while there are some, uh, and I do mean nominal warrants attached to the, uh, the debt facilities we put out there, um, on a relative basis of giving up equity versus taking on debt, um, this, is, this makes the most sense in terms of its non-dilutive uh, natures. And what I've just described is the senior venture debt portion of the overall debt value chain. Um, there are other forms of debt capital depending on your stage and depending on your liquidity profile. Um, there are some groups that are earlier stage in orientation, um, the, the lighter capitals of the world, the dreadnought capitals of the world, um, uh, the flow capitals where perhaps it's a revenue-based uh, financing that is best suited for your particular business. Um, but there are different providers because those are generally speaking non-bank lenders, we're not gonna focus on them as much, uh, but they are a valuable part of the overall debt value chain. And then as you become a later stage business into series C, D and, uh, and onward uh, rounds uh, of size, uh, there's uh, other sets of debt providers that we partner with in many, many cases where we're the senior uh, debt tranche and then there's a subordinated debt tranche uh, below that. So it's a, it can get complex at times, um, but there's certainly, um, I would say, an intentional sort of group of debt providers out there that best suit your particular uh, 
phase of, of life cycle as well as uh, secular growth of this. And so it's a little bit about, uh, at least from the tech orientation. JC, you want to take it from the, the healthcare side? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great overview because I think in, in many respects, um, as it relates to the life science side of things, uh, you know, companies tend to take on debt or look at, at debt facilities as, as you said, uh, as a way to extend the runway. Uh, for life science companies, you know, when a company gets funded, there's a, a plan for uh, achieving certain milestones, and some of those may be regulatory milestones, um, things, uh, timelines that companies think they can achieve uh, over a certain period of time, and that's fundamentally what the equity investors are funding. Um, but as, is, as most things, right, there, there's a plan, and, and there are some things that, that companies can control, and there are some things that are out of their control. And so one, you know, one reason that a, a company would take on some, some debt would be to help extend the runway and provide, uh, to some degree, an insurance policy, provide uh, a company with some additional cash burn if things were to take a little bit longer, say if there's a regulatory hurdle that needs to be met and, and the timeline is uh, 12 to 18 months from now, but um, for one reason or another, things slip in terms of uh, time scale and, and that debt helps provide with the company some cushion on the back end and, and being able to give them a little bit more time in order to achieve those milestones to raise that next round of equity. So I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, fundamentally what we're doing is we're taking financing risk. Um, a company raises equity dollars to achieve certain milestones, and we are taking the risk that a company backed by a certain syndicate of, of investors is going to be able to achieve those milestones and then subsequently raise that next round of capital. So um, in many, you know, in many respects, I think on the healthcare side, uh, the primary use that I see companies using debt is to provide that runway extension or insurance policy. And then in some other instances, you know, there, this is probably less so these days, but uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, companies would use uh, debt financing to finance lab equipment or build outs um, as they, you know, as they were needing those, those, uh, those types of uh, pieces of equipment to uh, execute on, on their experiments. Um, that's slowly kind of fallen a little, uh, uh, by the wayside in terms of when you're seeing companies coming out of accelerators and, and using those shared services on, uh, from a lab space standpoint. But historically, there, that has been one of the uses has been uh, financing equipment that you really don't want to use expensive equity dollars to, to purchase. You can just finance that through a, a debt facility. Um, and then the other place where I've seen companies think about uh, debt use is where uh, while the primary uh, round of financing that a company has um, raises on the healthcare side is to achieve um, one or two particular milestones or, uh, or advance certain um, drugs or, or uh, devices, um, sometimes there may be a smaller amount of, of funds that they could use to fund a small pilot or a small project that could be additive and help increase the valuation of the, of the company when they go out to raise that next round of equity. And in some instances, you know, the, with a small amount of capital, they could do some preliminary work, uh, whether it's animal work or um, some, some initial just uh, basic pilot work. Uh, so those are some instances where we've seen companies think about using debt as a, as a vehicle to achieving those, those milestones to increase the valuation on the next round. Hey, JC, I, and I actually probably should have said this during my segment, um, to give folks a, just a sense, our initial check size out of the gates is uh, at least for the portfolio company part of the equation, as I alluded to before, different from what Michael does on the fund banking side. He'll get to that in a second. But our typical range is 1 million up to 35 million, maybe even at 40 for initial check size. So as you can sense, um, you know, depending on the size of the equity round that you've raised, um, we can layer in, in a judicious way, a, a pretty meaningful amount of senior venture debt onto the onto the balance sheet. Agreed, and I think you know one of the ways in which we think about it uh, is the debt relative to the total equity raised, uh, and then also in conjunction to how does that debt amount compare to the the in, amount of invest, investment that the institutional investors have put in uh, individually. So. You know, kind of, I think our general use of rule of thumb is that 20 to 25% debt to equity 
of the total amount raised on the institutional round, and then we'll look at that compared to uh, how much the individual VCs have put uh, into that investment at, at that round. So hopefully that's a good overview for, for the life science side of things. Kick it over to Mike. Yeah, so on the fund size in terms, uh, fund side, excuse me, in terms of size, we're looking about 10 to 20 percent of the fund's commitments. Uh, so we're really comfortable between one and 75 million in a line size. Uh, the bank can go up to complexes north of 600 million, but uh, typically in venture, we're, we're a lot lower than that. So uh, the safety and security of our large balance sheet affords us the ability to do bigger deals, but we try and stay in the lane and, and help funds with, again, 10 to 20% of committed capital to dictate that. Um, you know, we'll get into types of uh, lines in a, in a minute here, but just going back uh, on venture debt at the portfolio company level and how it's beneficial to the fund in so much that it helps the fund's matrix metrics um, it provides later inflection points to do valuations for better products, more revenue. And, um, you know, it's not true leverage on the company, but it does help leverage the, the fund's performance. Uh, so it is a beneficial tool, even at the fund level. Great. Thanks. So I know, Jeff, you touched on this um, a little bit, but why, just to highlight again, why may a company take on venture debt as opposed to other forms of financing. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. It's really, um, it, it's, it's a situation in which um, the company has the ability to amplify the balance sheet um, use of, u utilizing this type of product or this type of financial instrument. Um, and so that's born out of the fact that once that equity raise has occurred, uh, from an institutional venture source, uh, that's when our tier opens up as a as a, a prospective option for a company to explore um, to do all the things that we've already mentioned, right? So runway extension, amplifying the round, enhancing return economics, uh, all of those sorts of things. That's when it makes the most sense, and typically that's right around that Series A round demarcation. And, and then it progresses from there. So we usually will uh, have clients six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, right? Um, there's a lot of parallelism in terms of our holding period being congruent with the, the holding uh, cycle or period of the VC fund. And so what we typically look for is those long-term partner scenarios where we start with the A and it could be a one or two million dollar debt facility. And then we can take it and double it or triple it from there on the next round. And that cycle continues onward all the way through to uh, an IPO, perhaps, or whatever the logical liquidity event is for a particular company. And so um, that is, it's, it's very uh, specific in terms of its timing and the use of this type of instrument, um, but it's very beneficial at the, at the same time. Great. And when should a company avoid venture debt? Typically, um, it's in scenarios where uh, the outlook for revenue and liquidity are extremely difficult to forecast. Um, and, and that can be uh, an array of scenarios where whether there's um, limited uptake in the business model um, due to any number of reasons, um, or whether there's uh, just a lack of liquidity resources around the table to try to help the business get to that next inflection point. Um, so typically, you know, banks don't want to take equity risk. They want to take bank risk. And that bank risk um, is calibrated for uh, senior venture debt at that, that portion of the balance sheet. Um, when the crossover occurs in a very meaningful way, um, that's typically going to be um, underwritten by either subordinated debt providers, um, which is a different tier of risk reward profile than us, or equity holders. Um, and so if you, if you see a scenario like that, you really want to summon those folks um, at that point in time versus a senior venture debt instrument. Got it. Great. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about types of venture debt. So what different types of venture de debt are out there and can different structures be used across um, different sectors? 
certainly, yes, I'll take the, the first uh, run at this. Um, there's really, just to keep it simple, three types of uh, facilities that can be uh, explored uh, for an early stage technology company. Um, one is a traditional accounts receivable based line of credit um, where we would typically have an advance rate of something along the lines of 80% of that AR base, um, having to be mindful of things like concentration risk and, and, and different, different dynamics uh, of the DSO cycles as well. Um, but that's, that's the typical uh, form of financing for a business that is not a traditional SaaS business. Um, and it's one that um, has a, let's say a hardware, maybe a software component to it, where it's not a pure software company, might be a hybridized kind of, a, of approach. Uh, typically the AR lines are the most flexible and work the best in those scenarios. The second would be uh, what we call MRR facilities, where if you are a traditional SaaS company, um, typically, it's a right around that hundred to maybe 200,000 of MRR uh, is where it really starts to make sense where you can get enough lift off an MRR facility to make it beneficial to the balance sheet. Uh, the multiples typically vary between 3x MRR up to 8x MRR. Um, and then if you're a later stage company, uh, those go into a multiple of ARR versus MRR. Uh, but we're going to look at things uh, like contract duration. We're going to look at churn, um, LTV to CAC, all, all the traditional SaaS metrics. And we'll layer in a facility that um, gives you, like I said, an elegant type of uh, working capital kind of solution uh, for your balance sheet. Typical durations are a year, maybe a year and a half um, in terms of length. And then the third is uh, what we call term loans or non-formula lines of credit. Some business models are still evolving um, and it's hard to peg a particular formula or metric to that model. And so while, they're good, while there's a good business model to, to, um, to evolve and yet to, yet to sort of come down the road here and there's good liquidity, what we can do is uh, deploy what we call a non-formula line of credit. So not like an AR line or not like an MRR line but more of a uh, short-term tr tranche of capital, year, 18 months in, in duration, um, that can be renewed at that period of time um, upon maturity. And that typically works well where uh, there's, a, there's an evolution of, of the company underway, uh, but yet we wanna keep the duration a little more short-term versus long-term because the liquidity isn't maybe as expansive um, in terms of uh, a scenario where a term loan would be used. Term loans for us are probably the most common instrument we deploy. Um, they are uh, 36 to 48 months in total duration. Um, they have a 12 to 18 month, what we call interest only period, where the client can decide to use it or not. Um, if they do decide to use it, then at that uh, call 12 or 18 month line, then it'll start to amortize over a 24 or 36 month um, time horizon. Those are typically deployed in scenarios where the company has raised a sizable series A or series B round and has ample liquidity. Um, that's why we're able to stretch that debt instrument out over such a long period of time is because the company has a strong capital base. Moreover, it also has some strong growth metrics to it. Um, not that we have to have uh, sizable revenue lines um, to deploy a term limit into. It's just we need some demonstrable economics to start to model what the future looks like. Um, and so if we can have, you know, if we've seen some, some nice growth, we have that, you know, kind of that unit economic profile with the backdrop of good liquidity from um, institutional sources, that's what we're going to commonly deploy um, in an early stage. Scenario. So, JC. Yeah, so um, maybe just to go back to um, one of the previous comments. So uh, in terms of debt, uh, you know, I think the the time to, to think about putting a debt facility into place, particularly as it relates to say term loans or non formula lines of credit would be um, at that point, shortly after you've raised a round of, uh, of equity capital, um, probably the worst time to, to, to look at putting something in place uh, along those lines would be when you've got less than six months of cash, probably even more uh, less than nine months of cash. Cause then honestly you're, you're negotiating from a, not from a position of strength. Um, you know, you, the, the sources of 
lenders are going to be the non-bank type of lenders. It'll be at a higher price, but from an interest rate and also from a warrant coverage standpoint. Um, so, you know, my recommendation, the best time to do it is uh, shortly after you've uh, raised a round of equity. Um, so thinking in terms of, of the types of different debt facilities, uh, I would bucket it into kind of earlier stage and later stage. Uh, at the earlier stage, as Jeff said, you know, most of the debt facilities that we're looking at, particularly on the life science side, are term loans, um, and in some cases, some non-formula lines of credit uh, with basically the, the, the same type of uh, outlines that, uh, that Jeff mentioned in terms of duration, term, um, interest-only periods. Uh, and then as companies progress um, towards commercialization, that's when we start thinking about AR uh, based lines of credit or uh, recurring revenue lines. Um, those typically, for medical device and diagnostic companies, is where I see uh, potentially some AR-based type of facilities. And in that early stages of commercialization, we may think about some sort of hybrid model where there'll be some piece of it that is uh, a term loan that is interest only for a period. And then at some point, uh, whatever is not being able to be supported by a uh, receivables base can uh, then gets termed out over, over time. Uh, but, but then the company begins to shift towards an AR-based type uh, of uh, credit facility. Um, where we're seeing kind of more MRR um, lines of credit on the digital health side of things uh, at earlier stages where a company has perhaps secured some initial contracts with uh, either health systems or hospitals and there's some you know there, there's some line of sight on on how that revenue is going to grow over time you know that's where we would look at putting in uh, an MRR type facility in, in place um, but I think you know one of the things that that we at Signature do is we really think about each company separately. Right? We, do, we don't uh, try to apply a broad-based, um, you know, vanilla term sheet type of approach uh, when we think about debt. We really try to dig into the company, understand, you know, what are the fundamental drivers to helping the company succeed and, and putting ourselves kind of alongside the, the management team and the investors in, in crafting a debt facility that will help uh, the company achieve those, um, those particular goals. So, um, I think each, you know, each company is unique, each, even within each sector, uh, within say digital health, there are different types of facilities that will deploy depending on the type of customer that they're selling into. Um, and it's fundamentally, it's about understanding the company and, and kind of using our experience, our past experience uh, to help guide us in, in putting together and crafting a, a debt facility that makes sense for, uh, for a company. Uh, so I think that's probably one of the benefits, you know, with, between Jeff, uh, Michael and I, we've all been you know, working in this industry for 15 plus years, uh, close to 20. And so it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of experience to draw on and, and being able to kind of put together something that makes sense for a company. Michael? Yeah, so on, on the fund side, while it's not typically considered venture debt, um, in talking about fund debt um, that investors can utilize, uh, capital call lines of credit are, are very beneficial for a fund. And there's really three reasons why. Um, one is just efficiency around uh, your calling capital from your LPs and using a line of credit to get to uh, the closing transaction, figure out the amount that is actually needed layer in any management fees or other fund expenses that may come in the near term and then um, use the line and call capital once that number is known. So it just creates efficiencies for the back office and avoids overcalling or undercalling um, capital. The other is just communication and setting expectations with your LPs. If you say to them, I'm going to call capital uh, every quarter then they know and can expect that call and can and manage their, their capital accordingly. Um, and so line of credit in the meantime and clean it up quarterly or semi-annually is, is beneficial as well. And then the last one really is, is not used as much with venture funds, but to enhance the IRR and to delay the period of which the clock starts ticking on the IRR calc. Um, again, not as highly used in the VC market because typically LPAs have limitations on debt, meaning 90 to 120 day repayment cycles. 
Um, and so we will follow those LPA restrictions uh, if that is the case. But nevertheless, that is one of the benefits um, for us using a line of credit. Awesome. Awesome. So Jeff, on the tech side, can you run us through a scenario for structuring a venture debt deal? So what typical terms are out there? What should companies be looking for? What's considered market? Um, if you could just run through a scenario for the audience, that would be great. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, being careful not to over talk to JC and Michael. Uh, so yeah, there's really three primary um, guidelines that we look at, uh, at least from the, the, the tech side of, of the house. Uh, these are the thematic ones, and then I'll, I'll do a, uh, a drill down into like a, a specific structuring. Um, the first is, you know, generally speaking, um, as a senior venture lender, we are going to want to be uh, less than 40% of, of the paid in capital of a VC round. Um, that's one of the key guidelines for us because we don't want to be uh, one of the single largest investors um, at an early stage, uh, in an early stage scenario. Um, number two is that generally speaking, um, you want your debt to be roughly 15% you know, or less than the enterprise value of the company. Um, now for later stage scenarios, um, there's certainly, uh, you can certainly get some stretch pieces in there from both the senior and the sub debt angle, but everything, you know, that I'm articulating today is generally around that early stage side of the continuum that, that sort of series A phenomenon. Um, and then third is, I made reference to this earlier, is uh, at a minimum of $4 million of fresh paid in equity um, is, is where you could start to explore some of those senior venture debt facilities um that we had uh, facility wide or structure wise that we've gone through earlier um if if we were to kind of outline you know in terms of the, the different components to it on a sample deal um you know, i would say that roughly speaking and again it, it varies by geography it varies by business model it varies by um, liquidity it varies by a lot of different variables but just you know sort of rules of thumb to give folks um a general takeaway is in terms of the pricing, we typically price to prime and a spread over prime. Right now, um, I would say overall, it's probably 100 to 150 basis points. Current interest over prime is, that, is where I would say sort of the, is sort of the median of for the three types of facilities, an AR line, an MRR line, and a, and a term loan. I would say on average, the, the warrants, um, that we take are somewhere between one to 2% of the facility size, facility size of what we're putting in. So just to give you context, if it's a $1 million facility, it's $10,000 worth of warrants in whatever the most recently priced round is. Um, sometimes we can get creative and, and, and structure things like success fees, et cetera, that emulate um, those, those aspects. Um, structure wise, I am typically putting to work um, term loans more than anything else. Um, here in the Midwest uh, for, for Series A deals. Um, and so uh, covenant-wise, you know, some of these are no covenant facilities, depending on the syndicate, depending on the liquidity profile. Um, if we are to look at a covenant um, in a scenario, it's typically going to be either liquidity-oriented or it's going to be something associated with growth. And you're probably asking, well, why? And the reason why is because we want to make sure as JC uh, made reference to earlier, the company successfully raises a Series B round, and then after that, a Series C round. Um, and so we want to make sure there are protective provisions in place to safeguard so that the company um, hits those key milestones to command that next round, as well as at the next at the right valuation that they're desirous of and that we would be uh, desirous of uh, as well. So, you know, generally that is market for the, for the Midwest. Um, you know, I know JC in the Bay area is in a much more competitive market. Um, so it is hyper specialized in terms of what we do, but uh, roughly speaking, I would say that's, that's a, that's a, a view of, uh, of the Midwest. Great. Yeah. And JC, if you could just let us know a little bit about how this differs from the life sciences side. Yeah, no, I'd say, you know, um, there are a lot of similarities with uh, with what Jeff said in terms of in the Bay Area, just structurally in terms of the duration, the uh, the approach. 
you know, I like to put myself in the, in the shoes of the entrepreneur and, and think, you know, if I was in, in, in their shoes, how would I think about this debt? How would I think about like uh, comparing it um, between different uh, proposals? And a lot of times it comes down to, you know, the amount of capital, the interest only period, um, and how, how does that translate into runway uh, at the back end? Uh, it, most, and I'm talking mostly about term loans, because that's typically what we, uh, we, t we tend to do most of it at the early stage. Um, so in general, I'd say, you know, companies should look at the debt facilities being able to provide three to six months of runway on the back end. Um, and with, with uh, you know, the same sort of uh, dynamics that, uh, that Jeff mentioned, on the digital health side of things, a company raising at least four to five million in, in institutional capital. Uh, on the life science side, probably that um, that amounts a bit more, just given that uh, particularly for biotech companies, the the uh, capital requirements are much higher. So I'd say probably at a minimum a ten million dollar uh, institutional round uh, for for biotech companies or companies that are have a higher burn rate, um, simply because you, you, the ability to have a debt facility that provides you with some meaningful runway uh, begins to diminish if, if, if you're trying to stretch, um, if you're trying to cut it too close to the bone on the, on the fundraising side for biotechs. Um, you know, I'd say from a pricing standpoint, it's the same sort of uh, spread. So we'll, we'll do a prime based uh, plus, a, plus a margin uh, around the same, uh, you know, 150 plus, uh, depending on the type of risk that we're, we're taking. Um, and same on the warrant coverage, about one to two percent. Um, it, it is very competitive. I, I'd say you know right now uh, there's so much capital sloshing around in the market, both on the equity side but also on the debt side. And so some considerations, if I think about it from an entrepreneur standpoint, is you know is the lender that I, what is the reputation of the lender that I'm work, uh, potentially working with? You know what experience do they have, uh, both from an industry and just have they been around? I mean, have they gone through a couple of down cycles? Um, because that's fundamentally where, you know, you want to be sure that you have a lender that understands not only your business, but has you know, had the experience of, of going through that process because, um, you know, sometimes, oftentimes plans don't, you know, don't uh, materialize as expected and you want to have a, um, uh, a lender that understands the market and will work with you. Um, and I bring that up kind of as it relates to covenants. Right? There are a lot of um, the term loans that we do, particularly on the early stage side for certain syndicates are, um, are no covenant deals. But there are, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that in some ways it's, it's better to make sure that both the company and the investors and the lender are on the same page, you know, achieving certain critical milestones um, and, and having that kind of be a guardrail, if you, if you will, for the, for the debt facility. Because if things are not going, you know, according to plan, or things are taking a much, much longer than you know every everybody anticipated, then uh, I think both the entrepreneur um, would and the lender would want to know what is what is the backup plan, you know, what is the expectation from the investors, and you know, putting more capital in to continue moving the company forward. So I, I like to think of the covenants as as guardrails that you know brings people back to the table if things are taking longer than expected. Um, and, and that's where relationship and experience, um, an experienced lender really comes in handy because right, they're, they're not gonna be um, uh, reactive or, or um, you know, we'll work with the company through some of those challenges and, and uh, having somebody who's been you know, in the industry doing it with, uh, with startup companies for you know, quite a long time is, is important. I think that, that brings a lot of experience to the table. Very awesome. Thank you. Um, so for all the startups in the audience, what should they expect? What does a typical venture lenders um, due diligence process look like? And Jeff, I can start with you unless anyone else wants to um, start. Yeah, uh, sure. It's um, so the beauty of actually uh, layering in the venture debt right after or almost concurrent with the Series A round is that we piggyback on the overwhelming majority of that due diligence. So there's nothing you really have to create. It's just repurposed for, for uh, our cause. Um, typically, we will send an email out with about a 10, maybe 12 item punch list. Um, so financial projection, historicals, projections, business plan, cap table. Um, 
those sorts of things, maybe some SaaS metrics that, you know, depending on the, the type of business model it is, the board structure um, as well. Um, and those are kind of like the, 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 big, the, big, the big high level items. I mean, the areas where we really wanted to, to dig in on is understanding um, the defensibility of the business model to make sure it has the wherewithal and endurance. I mean, as, as, as everything's been sort of put on display in 2020 due to COVID, um, you know, we've seen some very interesting evolutions in some companies and we've seen some that have exploded to the upside. Uh, we have some of our portfolio companies growing 500 to a thousand percent. Um, but we have others that are sort of just steady, right? They're not, uh, they're not growing as they have projected, but they're, they're not declining either. And so we want to make sure that as we think about the architecture of our portfolio, um, that it also has the ballast and, and wherewithal to, to endure uh, economic cycles. And I do want to actually emphasize what JC said. I mean, the benefit of our team is that um, nearly everybody on uh, our, uh, our roster has 10 to 20 years experience, either as a seasoned venture banker or as an operator of, uh, of a venture back company or as a VC. So what we try to bring to bear is uh, not an itchy tr trigger finger. Um, we try to make sure we really have done our homework and due diligence up front, Julia, to your question, um, so that we understand over our holding period um, what that variance could be to plan at any point in time and making sure that when, we've, when we curated our debt structure to um, what makes the most sense for that particular business model. So, JC, you want to take your side? Yeah, no, yeah, I'd say um, to your point, the, uh, the diligence process includes kind of a, a standard list of items that um, you know, you've already probably have on hand if you've just recently closed a round of equity. Um, you know, one thing that, that I oftentimes recommend, particularly for early stage companies and, and maybe first time entrepreneurs is uh, something that I've, I found in, invaluable is putting together a Gantt chart, um, thinking about, you know, all, all the different sorts of sub um, milestones or, uh, you know, sub, sub target goals that, that need to be achieved in order to kind of move the company forward. And putting that graphically on a timeline and alongside what a capital need is for that, for each one of those items, I think is, is very helpful to, you know, kind of clarify for an entrepreneur, you know, what are the things that um, uh, need to be done in order to achieve kind of the, the, the milestones for the next round of equity. Um, because oftentimes like that's what I do in, you know, in the diligence process, I'll, I'll, we'll ingest all that information. We'll take the financials, we'll put it into our model. We'll, we'll look to understand, you know, what are the key drivers for the business? What is going to help that company succeed in the eyes of the investor and to either continue supporting the company or to raise the next round of equity. A lot of times our diligence calls with our, with investors are, you know, what, what is it about, you know, what's the investment thesis behind, you know, your investment in this company? You know, what attracted you to this company? What does this company need to achieve in order to raise that net, that net trend of equity? And if you were to be coming in on the next round, what would you want to see as an investor uh, this company achieve at a minimum? Um, and so all of that, you know, honestly, kind of, I, I, take, I synthesize that all and boil it down into a Gantt chart so that I have a, more or less like a graphical representation of, okay, this is where this company needs to be at this point in time. Um, and if, you know, things are kind of moving or shifting, um, it gives me a sense of, of what, the, what the risk is for the bank on the, on, uh, on the back end if, if things are taking a little bit longer than expected. But I think it's a great exercise. And oftentimes I, I find uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have already done that, um, but sometimes it's just not coalesced into one sort of Gantt, uh, Gantt chart document. Uh, but that's always I've found to be kind of a helpful guide for for entrepreneurs as they're, as they're thinking about doing a, a debt facility, because it helps answer a lot of questions that will naturally come up in, in the diligence process. That's great, that's a great tip. Um, so before we jump into a quick Q&A, just one last question for you all. Um, what does a venture lender typically look for in a partnership? Jeff, I can let you kick it off for tech. Actually, Michael, do you wanna go first? Is yeah, in terms of partnership, we like to, obviously there's synergies and overlap for the portfolio companies. And so um, that's a big one for us. We also are talking to all kinds of LPs, whether it be family offices, fund to funds. And so to the extent we can be helpful there uh, in a partnership with the venture firm, I think that goes a long way. Uh, and then just being, you know, helpful resource in terms of 
hey, I'm thinking about structuring my fund this way. And, and what have you seen in market and, and being a sounding board there uh, to help either change something or launch a, a venture fund? And for, for us, um, look, we, we, we take this uh, very seriously and, and um, we are empathetic with what it takes to, to build a business. Um, and so we look at it, certainly we are providing capital, um, but we you know, want to be uh, beyond that, uh, one of your, your, your best providers of whether that's introductions to operators to help you build that enterprise. Um, I can't tell you how many folks we've um, uh, referenced. So whether it's CFOs, whether it's CROs, whether it's uh, heads of product, you name it, um, because of the, the breadth of our operation um, and the, uh, the ability to talk to so many different funds and companies, um, we're able to be at the nexus of a lot of those insights. And so how can we help you build the business? And look, if you say no, that's fine. We, you know, uh, we understand our place on the, on the balance sheet, but at the same time, there's so much more to the relationship that can be had. And that's where we're desirous of, of helping you. And I think what it also does is it builds a level of rapport, transparency and communication, where if there is a, a, a blip in the business model, uh, we're well in advance, you know, sort of aware that that's going to occur. Um, and we can, you know, sort of work with you through those scenarios and work with the VCs through those scenarios. And so, uh, one, communication, and two, it's leveraging um, what we can try to bring to bear to really be additive and, and create enterprise value beyond just a, a strip of, of, uh, of debt capital. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so we can just, I know we're running up on time, but just go through some rapid fire Q&A. If we don't answer one of your questions, we are going to be following up with the recording so we can um, answer any of them. So if you have questions, please just queue them up in the Q&A and we um, can get back to you. We'll also share Signature Bank's uh, contact information. Um, so real quick, um, and feel free anyone on the Signature Bank team to take these, but um, what sort of considerations should startups think about when bringing on um, a lender? What sort of qualities do you, do you think they should look for? Jason, you wanna, you wanna grab that one? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd say, you know, when we think about kind of bringing on a junior lender, a lot of it really goes back to relationship. So people that we worked with uh, together in the past where we, we either have some intercreditor agreements already established or a relationship already in place. Um, I think that's kind of key where we really very much along the same lines as uh, with the venture investors and also the, the company. It's, it's all about relationship and, and transparency. So I'd say that's those are the key drivers. Uh, and we, you know, the fortunate thing is we've been around uh, in this business long enough that we have a lot of relationships at uh, venture debt funds uh, with people that we worked with before. So uh, a lot of times it's, it's, there's a connection or a warm introduction. That, that we... Awesome. Awesome. So someone asked just, does a startup have to have a functioning prototype to secure venture debt? So I, I guess the question really being how early is too early to, to secure venture debt? I know you touched on that a little bit. Casey, it's probably best for you because given the healthcare orientation, yeah. probably that question. No, so I mean, for us, really, the the point of, of entry is, uh, as Jeff said, when uh, companies raise some institutional capital, um, there have been companies that we that I worked with in the past that were literally uh, incubated within a, a venture fund with just an idea uh, or a venture fund backing a team where there was ways away from having a prototype or product. So the functional, you know, starting point for us is. Uh, is the company venture backed um, and is, is it at a meaningful level? So well, it, it's irrespective of whether it's a, product, a prototype or not. And is there a ceiling on that? So is there ever a point at which it's too late or you guys will only go up to a certain point? Uh, uh, in terms of the product or in terms of the size of the company? Um, in terms of the size of the company. Um, you know, we're, we've, we've banked some pretty sizable companies. Um, so we've got clients that are 25 to 50 million in revenue right now. Um, so it's, it's really, it's almost a, a little bit less about the, the letter designation of the round and more about whether or not uh, we can bring to bear a debt solution that's to the benefit of the company, um, both in structure as well as size. Um, 
so we, we can put some very sizable facilities together and we can do some other creative things beyond that as well. And we, we bank public companies as well um, that have started as a venture client and then onward uh, and after, after that. Um, but I would say our tendency is, and our, really our focus is to, to tend to go towards those earlier stage Series A type companies. Awesome. Um, so someone asked specifically about the clean tech space, but this can be in other industries as well. But uh, many startups don't sort of fit typical startup metrics. Um, how do you look at sort of evaluating different opportunities when you're looking perhaps at an industry, I don't know if you've looked at clean tech, that have sort of alternative metrics? Um, I could take the, the first run at this and JC, if you have anything. Um, we are, uh, the fun and, and intriguing, you know, sort of part of our job is that we're humbled every day to learn uh, we touch a lot of different technology sectors and, and uh, we get to look at a lot of different business models. And so um, it's more about just understanding what those KPIs are associated with that particular business. Um, it's not to say that we would say oh, it's clean tech, we're not going to go near it. Um, it's more about um, is there an adequate fit for debt in that scenario? Um, and so the, the, the breadth and depth of our portfolio is, is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty pronounced. You know, while software is easy to lend into, um, we have some very unique business models that we've been able to get comfortable with um, and the VCs have gotten comfortable with as well. And so um, I would never ex exclude other than what I'm regulated to exclude <laughs> from a statutory perspective, um, a, a typical or any type of uh, business model or sector. Yeah, got it. That actually is a good segue into someone was asking just, um, are there any sort of industries where regulation is changing that you would not invest in. Um, so they mentioned cryptocurrency, um, but yeah, how do you think about that in terms of changing regulations? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's typically you know whatever the house the house rules are is sort of how it cascades down. And so, generally speaking, it's been all banks that are precluded from from lending to, to those same sectors. And so, that's the the guidance that we uh, that we follow. Um, you know, have we spent time exploring? almost in like an R&D way, how to open up some of those pathways to some of those unique companies that are out there. Uh, yes, uh, but it always has to be, you know, from a regulatory perspective and compliance. Awesome. I will um, say that Signature, just a little plug for our friends over in the digital assets team. Uh, we do bank cryptocurrency um, companies and funds. So uh, not in the venture group, but Signature has uh, some expertise in that area. I think we're the first, Michael, we're the first company in the, in the, we're the first bank in the country or in the world to launch a blockchain based digital payment system. Is that, isn't that right? That's right. Yep. Signet. That's awesome. Awesome. So last question, um, that is a little bit about sort of the time frame. So based on sort of like the receipt of an application for venture debt, how, how long does the whole process take? Yeah. For a tech company, um, I can give you my answer and then JC, if you want to take it from a healthcare side, um, I would say uh, from the time in which we have the initial dialogue um, and we send that call it 10, 12 items in an email over to uh, usually it's the, it's the CFO. Um, we can have a term sheet to the company um, sometimes in 24 to 48 hours. I would not say that's the typical lead time, um, but we can respond very, very rapidly. I'd say, Probably the median somewhere in that week time frame, um, in, in, in that range, depending on the size and complexity of the of the deal, and then once they, as a as a board, have con convened uh, and opined on on which direction they want to go, and if they do select us, we're typically looking at, well, I'd say, on the fast end, four weeks to get to a close, um, maybe as long as eight weeks, depending on the complexity of the business model, with a mean somewhere in that kind of six month six week time frame. Yeah, I, I agree with Jeff. That's typically around the time turnaround time in terms of about a week for uh, a term sheet, and then uh, you know moving to close, uh, you know, four weeks would be at, at the fast end. Um, sometimes that just depends on uh, negotiating the, the the loan security agreement. Um, but yeah, that that's about the same for healthcare. And same for funds. Awesome. And just one last quick question. Is there any sort of advantage between venture debt versus just like a federal small business loan? JC, you probably, JC, you, you probably deal with that more than I, than I do. Yeah. You know, I, I, 
I mean, I'd say on the small business loan, I, I, you know, to be honest, most of the companies that we work with, um, you know, those, those are not ones that uh, are really looking for some uh, federal small business loans. I mean, it, uh, most of the time it's uh, outside of say grants, um, it's too early stage for uh, healthcare companies to, to consider that. We've had, um, it, not necessarily SBA loans, but we have worked with uh, a number of state-based institutions that actually have something that parallels or looks very similar to an SBA loan. O Ohio has one and, and there's different states in the Midwest. And so we'll work with them on intercreditor agreements and, and, and whatnot. In some cases we actually are just used to pay them down um, because the companies raise fresh equity. So it, it can play a meaningful part in the balance sheet initially. But um, they typically um, are not of the of the size that we'll, we'll, we'll put to work in a particular deal. Um, so we'll usually take them out. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we you had some great questions. Um, thanks so much to Signature Bank and the team for joining us and for such an informative discussion. Um, just to reiterate, we'll be sending out an invite for all startups to log into the um, conference scheduling solutions at the end of the week. So you'll be able to see what um, funds are looking to meet with you. And we will be sharing more details at the end of this week as well. And we'll send out a recording and some additional